So have you ever found yourself holding up an antenna like this to listen to a radio station? I don't recommend it. Welcome to the house of... It's tempting. The Vintage Vibe. Today we're going to do a little review and take a peek at... Well, it's not terribly vintage, but it is a few years old. This is the Pioneer Elite A6. So why review a mid-2000s amplifier? I mean, surely there must be more interesting things to look at and to talk about. That's the interesting thing. This little amplifier is an amplifier that's impressed me, not just once, but twice. Let's talk about it and find out why. Okay, well, let's take a little peek at this guy. Now, right now, we've got it hooked up through two tiny little test speakers, obviously. Not gonna do it any sort of justice. And I've opened it up because, well, it was going to make a home here in my system for a while. And as you can see inside, it is filthy. Filthy amplifiers don't have any place on the equipment rack. So we're going to bring the amplifier outside and we're going to lightly blow it out with some compressed air. And then we're going to bring it back downstairs, do some close-ups, and talk a little bit of what makes this budget amplifier so unique. So before I get cleaning, I always wear a mask just because you never know what you're breathing in. And nowadays, you know what, with everything going on, your neighbors don't look at you very weird. So again, we're gonna give a light dusting. We aren't gonna crank up the pressure extremely high um, because you know what, electronics don't like 50, 60 PSI of air being blown at them. Again, you can see the dust going everywhere. The reason why we wanna wear a mask. The reason why we don't wanna be really blowing high pressure air, you know, at the uh, the amplifier is these compressors sometimes uh, will spit out a little bit of condensation which you can be getting on the components as well as if you are spraying directly at things like transistors um, particularly the outputs and whatnot you could be creating static uh, which is not another you know great thing as well too to be introducing pretty clean let's go hook it up back downstairs so the first thing you notice here on the back is um, you know it's laid out pretty neat and symmetrical and one of the reasons why I bring that up is this whole amplifier is quite symmetrical. When you look in, you know, at the top, this is arranged in what looks to be a dual mono type configuration. So to see the speaker terminals truly on the left and right side, kind of a reminisce of a power amp. Uh, you know, even, um, uh, you know, a higher quality integrated amplifier. This unit here, you know, wasn't cheap per se when it was brand new, but today it's really a budget unit. Uh, up here you have your FM input here for a antenna and uh, unfortunately you have to use this slip-on style because it doesn't have threading on it to be able to use a good quality antenna but the receiver portion the antenna portion probably wasn't a huge concern with uh, Pioneer at the time you have an AM loop you have a trigger down below here which I'm assuming would be used when you're kind of daisy chaining this maybe with other components and for inputs you have tape which is kind of unusual to see nowadays you know we don't really use tape it's just not a common thing you also have auxiliary one auxiliary two CD and a phono stage which is great because more and more I'm seeing components without phono stages and then you have to buy an external one yourself um, and then you have a power cord input here it's nice to to see that you can kind of select your own power cord with this one um, to be able to upgrade it and the one that came with it actually is pretty decent. And this one would have been manufactured in 2007. So we've got the amplifier connected. And as I was mentioning earlier, you can see the power cord there. It's actually a decent quality cord, but it gives you the option to switch that out to, you know, maybe something a little heavy dutier if you have one. Um, the unit itself is very clean. It's nicely assembled. I find that, you know, impressive to look at it. Um, that everything's kind of neatly organized and again in a true kind of mono configuration where you have the left side of the unit looking symmetrical to the right side of the unit essentially meaning two amplifiers in one chassis and further you know we can see here two separate 
power transformers, left and right channel, as well as two separate stacks of capacitors, and a fair amount of capacitors at that. You know, so we've got a healthy power supply in this amplifier, which again is really surprising for 45 watts. Um, usually in a 45 watt amplifier or receiver, you know, you'd see really thin, you know, uh, finned aluminum heat sinks. You wouldn't see cast aluminum like this. Um, you certainly wouldn't see two separate transformers in a receiver. I mean, think about that. When's the last time you've seen dual mono in a receiver? Um, the unit over here, which is your receiver module for the radio, and you can see where the antenna goes into the back of it. Again, this is kind of cool because in the 1970s, the higher quality units, they'd put aluminum around it, and that was to um, kind of deflect um, interference, electromagnetic interference that could mess up the uh, tuning. So this seems to be a really well thought out unit inside. Again, for only 45 watts, and it's pretty heavy. I'd like to show you one other thing. You can tell I've got too much time on my hands. As you turn on the unit, can you see that uh, blue diode that just kind of lit up both on the left and the right side? Um, one, when it's dark, it's kind of cool. Um, you hear the protection click in there. But um, what I want to show you is this. As you shut the unit off, you can see it remains lit for a while. Now that's a sign that again, the power supply's got lots of reserve. It's very similar to the Bryston when I shut it off. You know, the green lights, the eyeballs, as we call it on the Brystons, continue to glow for quite some time. So again, a neat little thing, and uh, you know, a little party trick you can share with your friends, um, you know, late at night. Okay, so to turn it on, we got a little card size remote. Click, and you can see the display light up, and very shortly after, the display will actually shut back down. Now the idea behind this is the fluorescent display may be a, a source that introduces interference and the sound is not as result as pure. So this is part of this Pioneer Elite's direct mode. Now if we turn the direct mode off, you'll see the display will light up and stay lit up. Sony's ES models were very similar when you put it into a direct mode or I think they called it a pure mode. Um, the display will shut off. Again, if you go into direct, and this is bypassing things like your tone control, and you can see it says direct when you do that, um, then you have a pure sound. And I will say there is a notable difference switching back and forth between direct as well as tone, even if you have the tone controls set flat. Part of what I think makes this amplifier sound as good as it does, or this receiver, I should say, you can see right here a little insignia and uh, it's very faint but that says Air Studios. Now Air Studios is out of the UK and uh, they basically tuned the amplifier. That's the concept behind this. This amplifier was tuned by Air Studios, a very famous recording studio. So the amplifier has some differences between maybe the run-of-the-mill Pioneer. Being elite usually it's a step up but the Air Studios tuning you'd see in a bunch of the receivers, particularly the home theater elites, the higher end versions. And I'll show you some of those little minor differences here. Again, as silly as it may sound, things like using copper screws was a deliberate decision on uh, the part of Air Studios. And when you look into the unit, you can see various copper screws throughout. Copper is more expensive, obviously, than just standard kind of metal or alloy. You can see the copper again at the grounding points and stuff like that. It's kind of used throughout the entire amplifier as part of the tweaking or the tuning by Air Studios. Um, certainly, some of it would be the choice likely in the capacitors as well as the layout being in a dual mono type configuration. Another thing was the stiffening of the chassis where you could kind of see a block type construction. They have kind of metal separating the um, the different sections of the amplifiers or the amplifier itself trying to stiffen it up and reduce vibrations that would also be you know you'd notice in the selection of the footing on the amplifier the stiffer the amplifier the less vibrations and the idea again is we're not introducing um, kind of external noise and there's a close-up of those feet on the Elite the A6 they are kind of a solid metal you can hear it there it's not a cheap plastic Again, another deliberate 
kind of tweak to the amplifier by Air Studios. You'll notice on the Elite, you have to really turn that volume knob to get any sort of response. So you'll likely be finding yourself taking this remote control and using it here because it's a little more sensitive and it'll scale up and down a little bit quicker. Okay. You also notice beside your input selectors, you can select uh, you know, your tape for example, or your phono, or your tuner, auxiliary one, auxiliary two, and there's an XM radio mode as well too in there. You've got provisions for earphones if you happen to be a headphone type of guy or girl. And um, you know, then you're direct on and off. It's a pretty straightforward unit. The little remote control gives you all your basic features you need. You've got a tone and balance switch. You'll notice if you press this and it's in direct mode, it's gonna tell you, nope, you can't do that. So what you have to do is turn direct off and then press your tone and balance and then you can kind of scroll between bass, treble or bass flat so on and so forth. Go back to your direct mode if you like and turn it up. So it's a pretty simplistic unit with just the bare essentials. So a summary, a little wrap up on that little Pioneer. You won't normally hear me rocking it out like that, but you know I'm a little more into blues and jazz and stuff like that, a little mellower, funkier stuff. But you know what, it was fitting for that little Pioneer because that little guy can really rock it out. Um, that's why I've had it twice now. Uh, a while back I had to sell some of my um, um, more hard to find, kind of rare pieces. And uh, that's sometimes how this hobby goes, right? And I purchased it because it was a, a budget receiver and I thought, geez, looks hefty, looks solid. I was impressed. I used to have it hooked up to a pair of full range drivers back then. Johnny Cash sounded really good on it. Um, fairly recent, again, I decided to reacquire one to build a simple system here for the rec room. And um, you know what? It's a great unit. It does not um, uh, disappoint, I guess is the best way to put it, for what you pay for one. Because you will find one used between about $150 and $200 Canadian in 2020. And that's pretty cheap for a solid little piece like that. Now it does run a little bit warm, even though it is a class AB amplifier, it will heat up a little bit. So keep it ventilated, but it's got a really good bottom end to it, which is impressive. Um, it's a fairly mellow sounding receiver. It's not very digital sounding. It's got good presence, good imaging, a lot of things we associate with higher end products. So I think Air Studios did do something right. Now, if I had one complaint about it besides the really cheap remote, because that remote is garbage, um, the tuner portion of it, it could be a little bit forward, it could be a little bit edgy sometimes, give you a headache, you know, when it's at low volume. So I had to connect a separate tuner to it and then it just solved the problem. So that's a little disappointing. It may have also been the match of the speakers because the Heresy 3 sometimes can be, you know, a little revealing, a little hard as well too with the horns. Would I recommend it if you're building a budget system? and it didn't necessarily have to be vintage, I definitely would. Just because they're so cheap, I love budget pieces. So again, thanks for joining us today on the Vintage Vibe. We'll catch you soon. One last thing, I'd love to hear about your favorite budget systems. Put it in the comment section. Don't forget to like us and subscribe.